Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the LSE for this online event. Um, my name is Johnson Hopkin. I'm a professor of comparative politics in the Department of Government and in the European Institute here at LSE. And uh, it's a great joy to be able to welcome Vivian Schmidt here for tonight's online event. So Vivian is a, the Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Professor of International Relations in the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies and P Professor of Political Science at Boston University, as well as founding director of Boston University's Center for the Study of Europe. She has made uh, an incredible contribution to the understanding not only of Europe and European integration, but also sort of more conceptually and theoretically to the way in which ideas influence politics and political economy, with obviously particular reference to Europe. Uh, she's published very widely. I can only present a very small sample of, of, of her work here in the time available, but um, she's uh, a recent book she's gonna talk around, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. She's also the co-editor of Resilient Liberalism in Europe's Political Economy, um, Debating Political Identity and Legitimacy in the European Union, Democracy in Europe, and The Futures of European Capitalism, um, and numerous articles in, in peer-reviewed journals. Um, so you're about to hear one of the most influential figures in uh, the, the study of Europe. Um, so the title of the talk that Vivian's going to give is Europe's Euro brackets crisis of legitimacy. This lecture, she's going to define democracy and legitimacy and discuss its split level nature in the EU, detail the processes of Eurozone governance that led to deteriorating economic performance and the rise of populism in Europe. So this could hardly be um, more important, more topical. Um, so for those of you who like your Twitter, we have a hashtag for today's event, which is hashtag LSE Euro crisis. Um, this event is being recorded um, and will hopefully be made available as a podcast as long as we get the technical part right. So that will become available hopefully in a few days. Um, Vivian will be talking to us for around half an hour. And after that, you'll get your chance to put uh, questions to her. So to submit questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, the questions will then be submitted to me um, and I will try to put as many of these questions as possible to our speaker. Um, please, could you let me know uh, your name and affiliation? We're very keen, especially to hear from our students and alumni and incoming LSE students. So please point that out in your question and try and make the questions uh, concise and to the point if at all possible. Um, so, with that uh, piece of administration out of the way, it's a uh, very great pleasure to be able to hand over to Professor Vivian Schmidt. So, uh, Vivian, the floor is yours. Jonathan, uh, thanks very much uh, for that lovely introduction. Thank you all in the audience for being here, wherever here may be. Now I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully that works. We go. Um, governing ruling by Eurozone talk, but I'm going to end uh, with a discussion of 19 and how. Zone crisis. Essentially, in the fact phase, Vivian, hi. This is LSE events. The connection's um, a bit not great, so I think it may be best maybe if you stop your video, if possible. Okay. Are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to do it? Yes, we will share the screen for you. Okay. 
Because that's not working. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I'll just tell you when to change slides. So next slide, please. So Europe's Euro crisis of legitimacy. As the crisis began, what we saw was a fast burning crisis, 2010 to 2012. And it was all about governing by rules and ruling by numbers, which led to a crisis of legitimacy, which one could see in terms of the deteriorating economics and the toxic politics. By 2013, the recognition of this as the crisis slowed is that EU member state leaders and actors of various kinds, technical actors as, as well, began reinterpreting the rules and recalculating the numbers by stealth. But this too, obviously involved problems of legitimacy. You ended up with incremental improvement, but suboptimal rules and a perceptions of legitimacy in Northern Europe as well as Southern Europe. By 2015 and on, as the crisis slowed even more and there was a change in commission, um, EU actors generally admitted they were reinterpreting the rules for more legitimacy, but the damage had already been done. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry, back, back one. Okay, so you might ask, um, why talk about legitimacy in the Euro crisis? And what I found is it, it, it ends up being a very wonderful lens with which to investigate political economy, politics, and governance processes, and actually bring them together. It also takes EU actors as thinking, speaking, acting agents who also want to legitimate their actions. So it's about sentient agents. So it's not just about interest, which would be a more rationalist approach. It's not just about the path dependency on the rules, which would be a historical institutional approach, or cultural frames as a sociological institutionalist approach would have. All of those approaches, of course, are very useful, but it's, they're not sufficient. And so what I use, and this is for the political scientists in the room, discursive institutionalism is my methodological approach in which I'm looking at the substantive content of ideas and the interactive processes of discourse within the institutional context. And it's important to recognize here that that institutional context is the meaning context, logics of communication, but also the rationalist, historical institutionalist, and sociological institutionalist explanations that can serve as background information to this kind of explanation. And by using discursive institutionalism, it also provides a bridge to legitimacy, where I can go from the empirics to norms and values, but it also enables me to talk about power, ideational power as much as coercive and institutional. Next slide, please. So once we're talking about legitimacy, how do you define legitimacy? And there are two ways that I use to define it. One is the sort of the most conventional, the way most people look at it as legitimacy as public trust, public consent in a governing authority. Um, but that's one way and that actually can be a bit vague or there, it seemed to me that it was important to look at legitimacy also as governing activity, to look at issues of policy effectiveness, political responsiveness and the procedural quality of governance, at govern, governance as contributing to the legitimacy of a governing authority. And I'll get back to that in a minute as we go more deeply into what I mean by those. But I think the basic question we need to ask before going on is the question, is the EU democratically legitimate? And here the question is, as a governing authority? Well, I would argue yes, because policy area, from, from policy area to policy area, over time in the EU, member state leaders, member state governments, and tacitly the public accepted the legitimacy going of the EU, whether it started as a customs union, um, went on to the supremacy of EU law, a single trade representative, EMU. I suppose it's only the UK, we could say, that no longer accepts the EU as a governing authority as a result of Brexit. But let's leave that aside. Um, 
so if the EU is government, government, democratically legitimate as a governing authority, we get, and the next question is, is it democratic? I'm sorry, is it a democracy? And here, of course, that's more complicated. Basically, no, and not in the conventional sense of national state, uh, nation states and democracy, we know it, but its member states are democracies and the EU in the sense is its member states. So in that way, it certainly is highly democratic despite certain problems that we'll get to. Um, but is the EU democratic legitimate, democratically legitimate in terms of its governing activities? And here, even there, I would say in many realms, in most even, yes, but the Eurozone is the exception. And in particular, um, in, 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 in the way it's been dealt with in the past 10 years of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, next, please. So, what is this legitimacy in the EU's governing activity? And here, apologies for the, you know, sort of the jargon, but in EU studies, people use systems theory to explain it. So I, I used that language, but added something here. So for the most part in EU studies, scholars have talked about out legitimacy and input legitimacy. Output legitimacy is a performance criterion and it essentially focuses on policy effectiveness and policy performance. Input legitimacy is a political criterion. It's not only about citizen representation and participation, it's also about political elites responsiveness. And importantly here in the scholarly literature, but even in sort of ordinary everyday life, people assume a trade-off between input and output. So a policy works really well, the citizens haven't, has, the citizens, citizens haven't voted for it, but it's fine, it works, it's legitimate. Similarly, citizens have voted for a really stupid, um, worthless policy. It doesn't work. It's still legitimate because they voted for it. Um, and so there are the trade-offs. So what I've done in the book and even part, prior to that is add another put to, all, to the systems theory using throughput, which is also a term that David Easton used when he came up with systems theory way back in the 1950s. Um, but he had a very limited um, definition of that as basically bureaucratic um, administration. But here, what I do is I say, you know, beyond output and input, beyond performance and, 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 and political responsiveness, we all talk and scholars talk about a whole range of other criteria of accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, openness. And they've all been kind of floating out there. So what I do is I group them together in throughput, which is a procedural criterion, talking about the quality of the processes. Efficacy is part of that too. And I say, then let's ask, how does throughput legitimacy compare to output and input? And here I argue there are no trade-offs. If you've got good throughput, good quality processes that are um, efficient, accountable, transparent, inclusive, and open, they're almost invisible. What citizen looks at, asks about the quality of the processes, so long as they are qual you know, of high quality. But if the procedures, if the governance uh, appears oppressive, biased, corrupt, incompetent even, then that can taint perceptions of the performance, the output legitimacy, and also skew the politics, the political legitimacy. So there are actually not the same kinds of trade-offs and essentially no trade-offs. And the problem in the EU, in particular with the sort of the depoliticization that we've seen over time, is that EU actors always seem to assume that basically throughput was the trade-off. All you needed to do was have good quality processes and that would lead to good performance and therefore it doesn't matter that the people weren't involved. And that has been a major flaw and that was the main flaw in the Euro crisis. An assumption that all you had to do is double down on the rules and everything would be fine. And that's not the case. Next slide. So before we go on to illustrating that, I just wanna do you know, one more slide on the EU and how to think about the EU more generally right now. And this is about the EU kind of split level legitimacy. Um, so at the EU level, essentially, yes, it has the European Parliament, 
But for the most part, the EU level is about output and throughput. It's about good performance, assuming that it's going to have good performance and good procedures, good governance. And it's at the national level where people vote for their governments and their member state leaders are represented in the, in, in, in the council, et cetera. But it's at the national level that we have serious democracy, that it's about political input at the national level. And this split level legitimacy has increasingly caused tremendous problems for the EU and a politicization of the, of the EU generally, but in particular of Eurozone go governance. In response to the Eurozone crisis in particular, although not to the exclusion of other crises, at the bottom we've seen growing Euroscepticism. From the bottom up, the EU has moved from a permissive consensus in the early years to a constraining dissensus, as the post-functionalists call it, at the EU level, which means mainly in terms of the council, but basically at the top. It's not just politicization of the council, it's all the EU, European Union actors that have become more politically engaged, more contestational, in fact. Um, so there's this new politicized dynamics of interaction that I'll illustrate later, um, where there's more contestation, where the council accuses the commission of not doing the right thing or the European Central Bank, and the commission says, no, I'm a political commission. This is Jean-Paul Juncker, um, and that's fine. And it goes on. So I guess our question here is, is politicization a good thing or a bad thing? And so if you're looking at, no, we're still back on the previous slide. If, if we say that politicization, and we certainly can say it's a bad thing, if you look at the content of the discourse, where um, German Minister of Finance Wolfgang Schäuble complains about the commission for not doing the rules the right way. This is delegitimizing in a very serious way. So the content, the perception of, 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 of the citizens is, is that bad things are going on and that politicization therefore is a bad thing because um, of the content of, the pro of, 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 of this new politicization. But in terms of, in terms of the um, processes, actually, one could argue more readily that it's a good thing. Yes, there's contestation. Yes, one actor is accusing the other actor of this or that. But isn't that what national democracy looks like as well? So that in a way, one could argue that, that kinds of processes that we're seeing, this politicization makes the EU look more like a kind of democracy, or at least having more democratic engagement than it had in the past with a depoliticization. So politicization could be a good thing, but it also could be a bad thing. Next slide, please. So in order to look at this, and in order actually to discuss legitimacy, I took a long time to figure out how you, how you approach this. And I so ended up saying what we need to do is you know, if this is about legitimacy, I too can't just say you're not legitimate, which of course, in many cases I thought, but how do you weigh the evidence? How do you create an argument that would enable us to walk through and actually appropriately assess whether various EU actors are legitimate or have, are legitimate or not and in what ways? And so what I thought is what we need to do is take a Janus-faced approach on the one hand, on the other hand, who sees, say, the council and Angela Merkel as not legitimate in terms of what they did, in terms of the governing activities, and who sees them, and what are the arguments you can make for making them legitimate? And so what I'm going to be doing now, and this is more on the throughput legitimacy side, and then we'll look at output and input very briefly, but on throughput legitimacy, we need to look at each actor on, in turn and the way in which they're perceived from the outside, but also the way they perceive themselves. So we take the council and the question here is, is the council dictatorship led by Germany or a mutually accountable deliberative body? There's a lot of evidence on the dictatorship side, you know, dictatorship led by Germany with the Northern European coalition engaging in or opposing one size fits one read German rules on everyone else. In particular, this is North versus South, creditors versus debtors. Um, and what's interesting here is if you, if you 
saw what the, how the actors themselves saw themselves. Well, they saw themselves as actually an input legitimate representative forum. You know, Merkel said, yeah, I rather like this EU method, European Union method and South Korea. He said, we are the most representative. But actually this is not an input legitimate forum. They're not elected by all of the people. They're elected by their own constituents. It's also not a throughput accountability form. No one's holding the council to account. The EP can't do it. No one does. And then whose interests, interests were best served? Here we can go to rational choice institutionalist accounts as much as historical institutionalists say. This is about German economic interests, no transfer union, make the South pay and not just German, but Northern European more generally, the creditors' interests. It's about political interests in terms of German um, regional elections coming up very soon thereafter. It's about legal interests. The German constitutional court constantly saying it's all about our democracy. Um, and of course, in Mercosi, Sarkozy joins Merkel in imposing a whole set of further um, uh, impositions on actually all the member states. So that's the case for dictatorship. But then you have to ask, wait a minute, you know, everyone was in on this and they were all voting in these rules, the stupid rules in uh, Romano Prodi's words. Um, so if they were all in it, perhaps this was actually a mutually accountable deliberative body, even if it's deliberation in the shadow of German power. And for here, the evidence is also clear. Yes, there was the stability discourse, ordo liberalism in 2010. Um, but by 2012, you get Mario Monti saying we need growth, supported by Hollande, and the discourse shifts to growth. By 2014, the discourse shifts to flexibility as Matteo Renzi goes to Brussels and supported by Hollande pushes that. And then by 2015, the discourse is investment. And this is important because it's not just investment. I mean, sorry, it's not just discourse. It leads to action. In, in large measure, the commission feels empowered to start reinterpreting the rules for better effect, uh, among other things. Um, OK, but what about the program countries? Here we're talking about Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and others. Here, I think it's very hard to stick with a positive, maybe dictatorship, maybe deliberative body that we had for normal non-program countries. For program countries, I think all you can do is say it's either a harsh, dic harsh dictatorship, and that's Greece and the third bailout basically being imposed certain rules versus um, deliberative authoritarianism for Ireland, Portugal, and Greece in the first and second um, bailouts. And here it's because the deliberative authoritarianism is because they all ended up discussing uh, and deliberating about the conditions that were being imposed on them, but they were imposed. Next slide, please. So what about the ECB, hero of the crisis or the ogre? On the hero side, ECB 2012, July 2012, Mario Draghi says, we're gonna do whatever it takes to save the Euro. And you go from one size fits none rules to basically whatever it takes. And what's interesting here is there's more legitimation in the sense that the ECB is hiding its interpretation, its reinterpretation of its mandate, but it's doing it in plain view. So you go from Jean-Claude Trichet, who says, gives a very, very narrow definition of what we can, of what the ECB could do, not a lender of last resort. It's all about credibility and slowly but surely, particularly once Draghi comes in in 2011, you get a move to a discourse of stability in the medium term and slowly but surely a move to doing almost what a lender of last resort does with quantitative easing in 2015. And here the legitimacy depends on the performance, which ended up being better and better, and on kind of procedural through accountability. As you saw um, the ECB go to expert networks um, for legitimation on these changes in the um, 
in the mandate, but in its reinterpretation of the mandate, but it also goes to the European Parliament in its quarterly meetings and uses that as a form of accountability, not just to the European Parliament, but more generally to the general public in terms of media um, um, reporting. But beyond that, there's informal political consultation as well. Um, so very different from the triche early years. So that makes the ECB very much the hero. But you could argue just as well that actually the ECB was the ogre. Because think about the Im imposition of austerity for ever, all countries and harsh austerity and structural reform for the program countries. There's a lack of accountability here on the part of the ECB in its quid pro quo on fiscal consolidation. The ECB says, okay, I'm going to bend the rules a bit, but in exchange, you member state leaders, you need to impose austerity, tighten your belts, everyone. And then for the program countries, complete lack of transparency when Jean-Claude Trichet sends secret letters to the member state leaders of Ireland, Spain, Greece, even Italy saying, basically, if you don't do something about your debt and deficits, we're gonna pull the plug on you. That is not simply throughput, uh, a lack of throughput transparency, legitimacy, but also input illegitimate because it's imposing on elected leaders. And needless to say, there's also a lack of e efficacy. Uh, the um, ECB waits much too long on moving to the lender of last resort and to quantitative easing if we think that already in 2008, all the other independent central banks, including the Bank of England, was already doing massive quantitative easing. It's five years on or, or more, seven years on if we want to take 20, 2008 to 2015. Next slide. So what about the commission here? Ayatollahs of austerity or ministers of moderation? Ayatollahs of austerity, 2010 to 2012. The commission was the, was the enforcer in the European semesters, one size fits all. And in the Troika, it was the enforcer for the Eurogroup. It didn't like it, and that's important to say, in particular as time went on and it protested, but still it was in there um, essentially pushing austerity and harsh austerity and structural reform. Um, but what about ministers of moderation? You know, but from 2013 on, the commission basically was between a rock, Northern Europe, and a hard place, Southern Europe. And as output legitimacy failed, i.e. performance failed, what you saw is that the, East, that the commission became increasingly flexible. It slowed the deficit reduction and it changed the interpretation of structural reform. This is really interesting. All you have to do is look at the annual growth surveys and in the first annual growth survey, 2010, 2011, the headline goal is fiscal consolidation. That continues unchanged till the new commission 2015. But over time, it goes from um, in 2010, 2011, crush the unions, cut the welfare state to by 2014, talk to the unions, talk to the social partners, do whatever you can to make things work and to focus more on issues of poverty and inequality that were absent entirely in the first uh, iteration of the European semester. And the, but the problem here and why the Ayatollahs of Austerity label um, sticks is because Ali Ren, the commissioner um, of uh, the economics commissioner, his discourse remained Ayatollah-like throughout. Um, so all about harsh austerity and structural reform. So the Juncker Commission comes in in 2015 and it says, we wanna be legitimate. Now we're gonna tell the truth about flexibility. Yes, we're flexibility, but we're gonna create real rules for flexibility because after all, this is all about rules. Next slide, please. European Parliament. So the big question here is, was it just a talking shop with no size fits all? And of course it has no, it had very, very little size. It had almost no remit in in these first years of the eurozone crisis but slowly but surely you, you could possibly argue that it became an increasingly equal partner and it certainly remains potentially an equal partner it became more of a go-to body for input legitimacy that's the ecb as we already mentioned um, but also the commission and it's a critical voice in reports hearings etc 
Next slide, please. So that's throughput legitimacy. But now, just very quickly, what happens? Governance by rules and ruling by numbers is highly problematic. And you can say it not only because of what we've seen about problems of legitimacy in terms of the governance procedures, but what happened? What was the outcome? Um, what about the effectiveness of the policy ideas? And here we, here we see failures in the framing, reading off the Greek case that it was public debt for everyone, whereas of course it was private debt for, for everyone, um, except for Greece. And then because of the failures in the framing, you get the misdiagnosis, that the problem was behavioral, no one was following the rules, as opposed to the very structure of the, of the euro. The result with the failures in framing and diagnosis is that you ended up with a bad choice of remedies, doubling down on the rules and therefore a lack of solutions. No fiscal solidarity, no euro bonds, no European monetary fund, and on and on and on. So what about policy performance and the outcomes? Here, there's a vast literature. And actually, part of the reason I ended up doing much less on output legitimacy than I had originally started doing in the book is there are so many great books out there on issues of output, uh, of the problems of policy performance. And so this is about problems of outcomes, macroeconomic divergence between surplus and deficit countries, little or uneven growth, certainly major problems in Southern Europe. And you can see this in the contrast with the US. Um, beyond this, problems with austerity and structural reform, tremendous differences amongst countries in terms of their variety of capitalism, their varieties of capitalism and growth models. None of that was taken into account. It was the neoliberal playbook, crush, you know, basically crush your unions, et cetera. And we saw a rise in unemployment and poverty and inequality just about everywhere. Next slide, please. What about input legitimacy? So political legitimacy. Here, what we see is in response very much to the Eurozone crisis. You see rising Euroscepticism, declining trust, increasingly negative image of the EU, and debates become national. There's less and less of sort of a EU-wide set of debates, but um, and new cross-cutting cleavages, uh, especially with the rise of the extremes on the right. Uh, and what are the sources of the discontent? Well, it's certainly the socioeconomics of people feeling left behind, the sociocultural um, um, concerns about loss of status or the changing faces of the nation, and of course the politics of take back control, of which Brexit is the best example. Um, and we see massive political polarization, also evidenced in the decline of mainstream parties and the rise of the populist Eurosceptic extremes, all of these anti-system parties. Here's a plug for Jonathan Hopkins' book um, on anti-system politics, which is excellent and goes into, into great depth on all of this. Um, next slide, please. So how do we reform the Eurozone? As it that COVID-19 crisis is actually doing a lot of the things that I have in the book, but we'll get to the COVID-19 crisis in a minute. Basically, how do you reform the Eurozone? What about more fiscal solidarity for output legitimacy? Here, lots of ideas that were floating around before COVID-19 focused on Euro bonds, green bonds, helicopter money, which is the ECB just gives money to the people of Europe. Um, but lots of work on unemployment fund, individual deposit insurance, an EU investment fund, much vaster than what Juncker suggested, but none of this happened. What about better throughput processes? You know, basically my view is jettison the stability and growth pact rules, but that's not likely to happen or certainly wasn't as I was ending you know, my conclusion to the book, at least make the EU rules and numbers guidelines, very soft guidelines for macroeconomic coordination, various ways to think about the ECB setting targets above in terms of inflation than the numbers suggest, commission recommend, and differentiate the recommended recommendations for different countries depending where they are, council and European parliament deliberate to make what goes on at the EU level in terms these rules and numbers, more input legitimate, um, more democratic, essentially. 
and look at the European Union and you look, look at the European semester, make it bottom up. It's now top down. It looks very hierarchical. EU Commission says member states have to follow. It's actually not quite that, but it looks like that. But why don't you flip it bottom up and create national industrial policy councils as a sort of a way to uh, limit the kind of popular anti-system parties um, views of uh, sort of a domineer, dominating, domineering EU forcing member states what to do. Uh, what's interesting is that in the, um, in the COVID-19 uh, response, what you see is the EU, the European semester is already flipped to some extent where it's the national, it's, it's, it's the national level where they're coming up with proposals, et cetera. And then finally, more avenues for input legitimacy and the unanimity rule, which is always a disaster, which makes it impossible to change anything once it, it's agreed and end up with super majorities and opt-outs, for example. Take the treaty-based Eurozone rules. If you can't change it because you've got the unanimity, take those treaty-based rules and make them ordinary legislation which then means it's part of the community method. It means it can be debated and can be changed. Or that even if it's not changed, the European Parliament, it, it's, it becomes more legitimate because it's debated and discussed. But basically you need more community method and more linkages between the European Parliament and national parliaments. And since 2015, we've actually seen a lot more of this. Next slide. So what about the COVID-19 crisis? You know, as the book was just coming out, I was putting the final touches on the book, COVID-19 hits, and my first line reads something like, the Eurozone crisis is arguably the worst crisis the EU has ever had, or at least in the past 10 years. Oh my God, in COVID-19, so I had to quickly, all I could do was change the first line of this, with the exception of the COVID-19 crisis, the Eurozone crisis is one of the, is the worst. And then I said, there are lots of lessons to be learned, but that's all I could do. The book was going to print. So let's talk about legitimacy during the COVID-19 crisis. So initially, February, March, it was the Eurozone crisis, déjà vu all over again. The council was unaccountable. It fails to act as member states pursue their own policies. The ECB claims it's not its mandate to deal with spreads between German and Italian bonds, and then Italian bonds skyrocket in cost. The European Parliament has no role to play, and the Commission is nowhere. Plus, it looks like the migration crisis all over again has national level borders go up. But things change quickly and much for the better, certainly in terms of throughput and output legitimacy. Um, the member states simply end budgetary austerity with big infusions. It's as if the rules on deficit and debt don't exist and they do it on their own. The council, in the council, the Franco-German duo is back as a mutually accountable deliberative body. Germany is no longer dictator on the contrast, on the contrary, is actually actively involved in, um, in promoting more solidarity. And here you get the Franco-German duo basically proposing a 500 billion recovery fund. And then they give it to the commission to consider. And the commission then, as ministers of mod moderation, um, up the ante, ante on the recovery fund and go to 750 billion in grants and loans. Um, and they've also suspended, they also respond to member state actions by saying everything's fine. They suspend the budgetary criteria, state, the state aid rules. And on top of that, they promote sure for to support employment. And as I said, recommend the European Recovery Fund. In the interim, the ECB becomes a hero without any of its ogre-like character, characteristics, no austerity and structural reform, just lots and lots of bond, bond buying through the pandemic. Uh, through the pandemic emergency purchasing program um, without the kinds of limits that were before. And the European Parliament didn't have much of a role initially, but just now in the budgetary talks, it's certainly much more of an equal partner as it pushed to put back money in for the health and rule of law. Final slide. What next? 
the, there's still some way to go. The populist anti-system revolt is not over. Governing by rules and ruling by numbers in the Eurozone have been suspended, but they have not been officially revoked. Uh, so we've got to worry that in three years from now, two, three years from now, the frugal four, as they were known during the final, the, the, the council negotiations, the frugal more, four may come back in and say, it's all about debt. Of course, this is investment in the future, not about debt, but that's the danger. And of course, the Eurozone still lacks the necessary instruments for optimum performance. It's a temporary fund, not a permanent fund. So these are not Euro bonds. This is not the Hamiltonian moment people wait, but still it's an excellent beginning. So I guess to conclude, the response to COVID-19 crisis reverses some of the worst legitimacy lapses of the Eurozone crisis. And so at least it's a very good start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, it would be great to hear the virtual round of applause, which uh, is undoubtedly there, but but can't be transmitted, which which is a shame. But that's uh, that's a real tour de force and uh, and and really fascinating stuff. Um, I'm going to wait for some uh, questions to be filtered through to me, and I'm going to exploit the the uh, brief. Uh, void to ask my own question. Uh, I know we've talked about the book and your ideas before, but it's kind of interesting to hear the talk through the prism of what's happening at the moment. And it just, you know, it does seem like the same thing over again, just just on a on a bigger and more urgent scale. And it and and it does almost make you think that the old story of Europe being made in a crisis has something to it, right? Because in the end we know that the resources could be made available <laughs> if they had to be. And, and yet the institutions and, you know, the mix of preferences we have amongst member states and ultimately amongst elect electorates too, is what stops, you know, what probably you and I both thought would have been the right thing to do 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, and and um, thankfully this time around, the situation was so much more urgent that there was far less delay and there seems to be less reluctance um, to, to do what needs to be done. So I'm just wondering whether that signals some kind of change, some kind of softening of the, you know, the, the various mechanisms through which solidarity um, is, is impeded at the EU level. I mean, can we be optimistic about the way the, the pandemic has played out in terms of European politics. So surprisingly, I'm very optimistic about this because I do see it as a major change. And I suppose to you know, the whole the sort of the assumption that Europe is made in crisis. Well, that assumes an inevitability. And what we've seen over the past 10 years is there's nothing inevitable. A uh, crisis can lead to failure and not success. And we saw failure in the Eurozone, we saw failure in the migration crisis, arguably we saw failure in the Brexit crisis, we're seeing failure continuing in security and defense policy, things happened there. But I can certainly say that in, in the economics and in the health policy, there's a major change. So I guess the big question is how do we explain that? And I've been thinking about this since the COVID-19 and I've actually got a piece coming out in a debate section of the Journal of European Pu uh, Public Policy that puzzles this through. And so if, if, if we think about what happened in the Eurozone crisis, and you think about political versus technical actors, political actors act and they feel they have to at a moment of fast burning crisis. Um, Whereas when the crisis is slowed, they're not gonna do anything because they have other crises to think about or everyday matters. Whereas technical actors in a crisis, in the fast burning crisis, have to have new ideas to make it work. So what happens in the Eurozone crisis? Political actors have to, have to do something. They turn to the technical actors. Technical actors don't know what to do. This is unprecedented. So they all turn to the old rules. Okay, let's just reinforce the rules. Throughput will make for good output and no need for input. And that's it. And then the crisis slows, political actors go off to other things 
And the technical actors are left with trying to deal with the aftermath or the continuation crisis. And that's when they begin to think, how can we make this work better? Because it's obviously not working in terms of output legitimacy, which is where they have serious legitimacy and throughput. And that's when you see these incremental changes, the reinterpretation of the rules by stealth, and then admitting to the reinterpretation, this is what we have to do. And at the same time, they're also coming up with new ideas, new big ideas, green, you know, the green deal, the European green deal, unemployment insurance, they're writing about this, they're thinking about it, but political actors aren't gonna act. All of a sudden you get COVID-19, political actors are saying, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And after that first moment of hesitation, they turn to, you know, and some political actors have actually been working on these things themselves, like Macron and, in front, and the French technocrats, but it's the, it's, it's the political actors look to the, to the technical actors in the EU, the commission in particular, and they say, any ideas? And the technical actors, yeah, we've got tons. Green New Deal, um, EU for Health. They've been trying to make, you know, to, but they had no remit in health. And so what you get is all of a sudden, all of these new ideas burgeon at a time when everyone knows that there were serious problems with the Eurozone crisis, but certainly the political actors weren't gonna say, hey, we're to blame. Yeah, no, these are all sunk political costs. No one is gonna admit that it went wrong, but everyone knows it went wrong and this is an opportunity to make it right. And certainly in Germany, this is clear. You know, when you even have Wolfgang Schäuble, finance minister, saying that we're not going back, the, you know, the Schwarze Null guy, the guy who's sort of the hero of ordo liberal, you know, zero, def zero debt, zero deficit. And, you know, he's, well, it's, I guess, zero deficit, not debt. Um, and he's now saying, we've got to do this. It's about climate change. It's about finally there's a moment and a space when everyone can shift. Of course, not everyone did shift. Your frugal four. Um, basically said, no, no, we believe in debt. We're worried and we don't trust the South. But quite clearly, Angela Merkel, for a range of reasons, whether it's enlightened self-interest, you know, it's the German auto manufacturer, manufacturers in Bavaria saying, oh my God, you've got to save Italy because we need our supply chains in Northern Italy. So it's enlightened self-interest, but it's also, this is a different kind of crisis. This is a crisis of, that's a humanitarian crisis. Um, and it's not as easy to say, it's not the, it's not as easy because it's not as asymmetrical. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you can't blame the South in the same way. Yeah. I mean, I, I just a little code to that. I just wonder if the pandemic in Europe had started off someplace else, like in the Netherlands or Finland, <laughs> whether things might have played out differently at all. Um, but anyway, that's, um, mm -hmm. that's for another day. So let's, let's start with some questions from from the audience, I'm going to give you three, uh, just so we can get through through more quickly. Um, so first, Donny Reed from London is asking, has the EU exhibited a lack of democracy and legitimacy in insisting in the past on a second referendum where a country is voted to leave? I guess, um, presumably, that, that means the UK. And currently, in its authoritarian act attitude and obstinacy towards the UK throughout the Brexit negotiations. Um, okay, next one up from Konstantinos Armaus, who's a student at the University of Edinburgh. Do you think that the inefficacy of the three bailouts on top of the austerity measures imposed on Greece uh, give grounds to argue against Europe's legitimacy? Um, and finally, David Walter, who is uh, a BA from Birkbeck uh, College, London. Um, in a New Yorker article in March 2020, Ezra Klein is claimed to have stated in his book, Why We're Polarized, that human groups compete less for resources than the, they do for social esteem, and esteem is a zero-sum game. Is there a zero-sum game for the legitimacy of the EU? Plenty for you to <laughs> go out there. Um, we have some more coming in as well, so uh, we'll take this. Okay, those yeah, those are great, great questions. So I'll take them in order. Um, so uh, the, the question about it, forcing countries to have a second referendum, I mean, 
yeah, basically referenda on the, I don't think anyone should have a referenda on the EU in many ways because it's, it's too easy to vote no. Um, I remember with the, on the French referendum on the constitutional treaty in 2005, I was in Paris talking to all sorts of friends um, and, 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 and actually looking at the posters. And there was one by Philippe de Villiers, a sovereignist, extreme right guy. And he said, everyone has one reason to vote no. And that's right, everyone has a reason to vote no. And it's so easy to vote no, because it's the EU. You're not voting for something that you think is gonna affect you directly. You're not voting for a new government. You're talking about, so, so there's a real problem there and even thinking about referenda as sort of part of a democratic, yes, it's democratic at the national level, but at the same time, it's highly problematic when we talk about the split level democracy that is the EU. And no, of course, when you force countries or you ask countries to re-vote, in some ways, you could say it's not entirely democratic, but in the revote, they could also say no. An interesting point, of course, is that small democracies always get set, get told, please, Ireland, would you go back and revote? I, Denmark, would you go back and revote? And actually, we'll give you all the concessions you want. And then people say yes, so maybe that is legitimate. But of course, in the um, constitutional treaty referendum, when France said no, big country, and then the Netherlands, and again, for very different reasons, the France, it was the plan B, the, the left thought that there would be a more democratic Europe if they voted no, yeah, obviously not. And in the Netherlands, it was all against immigration. And it was, so it's completely different thing. And that's another illustration of the problems, the problems that the EU faces in becoming more, more democratic in the kind of traditional ways we think of. So that's the response to one. And then on the three bailouts, um, and in the case of Greece, is this an argument against EU legitimacy? Completely, absolutely. There's no question. It was completely, it was terrible. This is, uh, if you think about uh, Philip Pettit's notion of, of, of Republican uh, legitimacy and, and, and definitions of democracy, this is domination. And I think the main piece of this is it never had to happen. All the EU had to do, the minute Greece says, hey, we got a problem. Um, and in fact, you saw that in 2009, when there was a different German coalition government with the SPD, the finance minister said, hey, it's not a problem. And the markets backed off. It's only when you get the new German government in coalition with the FDP, uh, the Free Democrats, that they become very hard nosed that Angela Merkel says, no, we're not gonna do anything and the markets panic. And they actually, the markets don't panic very fast. It's actually a slow panic as they give the council time to say, okay, here's how we're gonna fix this problem. And there were many different ways to fix it. Do a little bailout, just say, okay, Greece, off the books for right now, we'll figure it out. Um, we'll give you a slap on the hand. We'll make you try to reform, but, and that's it. Or even if they had had a different way of engaging in the reforms rather than saying fast deficit reduction, cut, 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 welfare, doesn't matter how many poor, how many people starve, who doesn't have access to, to healthcare, which is essentially what happened. They could have said, okay, we're gonna give you time to reform the pension rules. We're gonna give you time, slow deficit reduction, uh, but that didn't happen. And of course it didn't. And then once you got the rules for Greece, they were then harsh austerity and structural reform for the other countries. Terrible, terrible in terms of what the EU is supposed to be about, which is in the better interests of all. That's what output legitimacy is about. It is to make things work better for everyone, not just for the North versus the South. So in that way, you know, my answer is a very strong, it was wrong. And as I said, and as you saw, in my slides for the program countries, this was a choice, this was not legitimacy, it was a choice between two different forms of illegitimacy, harsh austerity or deliberative authoritarianism, which I came up with, I love that. I think that's a... <laughs> um, and so finally about, um, is it a zero sum game between, and I'm not quite sure I got that, between sort of kind of the economics and the social um, 
But I don't see any of this as a zero sum game. I think it's a way in which you consider how to, um, how to act in a crisis. And what we saw in the Eurozone crisis, it was, it was constructed as a zero sum game. Debtors have to pay back the creditors and that's it. Whereas uh, in the COVID-19 crisis, there's a completely different approach. This is not about punishing anyone. This is how can we all do it right together on the economics and on the social part. So if you look at the EU recovery fund, the next generation EU uh, fund, this is to go for greening the economy and society. It's for digitalization so that children from poor families all over Europe, not just in Southern Europe, but also North can actually have access to education, et cetera. And it's about the social aspects like paying for it, helping increase education, training, et cetera. That's all about investment in the future. Uh, that's not about debt for some. It's not a transfer union, which is what the Eurozone, the big fear was. This is a, you know, not a transfer union. On the contrary, this is a win-win rather than zero sum. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another three. Um, so here we go. Um, keep the questions coming. So this one is from David Wood, who says many economists have suggested the design of the Eurozone um, entails intrinsic and growing instability. Do you foresee a deepening crisis or some kind of positive evolution? Um, which I guess might follow on a bit from what you were just saying. Um, and a question from Kate Alexander Shaw, who's a researcher at the European Institute here at LSE. How do you compare EU and US responses to COVID? Uh, you could maybe argue that the US has more input legitimacy um, in that the response has been highly politicized, um, but fails badly on the output side. So is that the opposite of, of the EU? Um, and the third one is from Sara Pan Algarra. What is the role of the EU as a system in preventing the rise of undemocratic behaviors amongst EU member state governments? So wide panoply of <laughs> issues for you to grapple with there. Uh, yeah, um, no, very great question. Very good questions again. Um, so uh, to the first question, uh, David Wood, on the design of the Eurozone, and yes, economists did talk about problems with the design. You can go back to uh, even the early 90s and subsequently all the economists were talking about optimal currency areas and the US, that the Eurozone couldn't possibly work because it wasn't a, an, an optimal currency area. And I remember seeing a, a chart, actually that's in the book, which is one of my favorite charts which is I think a JP Morgan Stanley chart of what countries are optimal currency areas. And it starts with Latin American countries that look most likely to be an optimum currency area. Um, and then, uh, so it's Latin America, and then it's maybe former Commonwealth, uh, British Commonwealth countries um, as being closer. Um, and then it goes to all countries on X latitude and then it goes all countries starting with the letter M and then the EU, <laughs> the Eurozone, suggesting that the Eurozone is the worst possible optimum currency area and therefore it can't succeed. However, the US was not on that chart. Why? Because the US is arguably even less of an optimum currency area. You know, Europe has, the EU has, you know, France and Germany, but it also has uh, Lithuania or whatever. The US, much greater differences if you think about New York, California versus Mississippi or Louisiana. But what does the US have that the EU doesn't have? It's got fiscal federalism. It's got fiscal solidarity. It's got redistribution. It has a common tax system that takes massive amounts of money and then redistributes it so that it's the so-called red states that are getting a lot more money and it's the blue states paying for it. If only the red states would understand this, but anyway, 
that's another issue here. We can't get into American politics now, um, or at least not on this question. So that um, I don't see it necessarily that, you know, the Eurozone is not necessarily going to blow up, is not necessarily unstable, um, ex unless it doesn't do more. And so I see I'm really hopeful about this temporary recovery fund, the resilience and, you know, with the resilience and recovery facility. Um, be, it's temporary, but what it's quite clear, you, you commissioners are pretty confident that if it works, if it works in, sen in the sense that you do see uh, growth, that member states actually use the money effectively to green their economies, to actually move to another level, then they're sure, and I think they're probably right, that you're gonna see permanent um, EU debt, EU level debt, which is the biggest breakthrough. This is breaks all the taboos uh, that were maintained during the Eurozone crisis. So I see this as a wonderful moment, as a very positive moment of forward movement for the EU. Um, so this temporary fund is necessary to become a permanent fund. Um, and there you've got the equivalent of Eurobonds. Um, and beyond that, you've got um, other things that need to be done, individual deposit insurance. But it seems to me that, that we're on the way. And there's much more solidarity. There's a, there's the, this big fund is, and they'll be needed for a bigger one even uh, pretty soon. But all of that suggests already a massive amount of redistribution, a recognition that the money actually is going to have to flow from north to south in the sense that it's Italy and Spain that are most hit by the pandemic. But there's also a tacit recognition that they're most hit by the pandemic and can't survive because they were most hit by the Eurozone crisis. And they are women as a result of it. They're to get track in order to have increasing convergence amongst EU economies, output legitimacy, if you will, is to provide for you know more redistribution. This is all on the mind you. But also then reinforce legitimacy. Then you may see a decline in uh, Jonathan's anti-system politics. We have to hope. Um, so question number two, on comparing the EU and US in the COVID-19 responses, is the US more input legitimate because of the politicization? I don't think so. There's politicization and there's politicization. There's politicization for the good and the prophecy, more attention. There's also politicization for the bad in terms of the content. And then there's also politicization that leaves people dead. No free. And the politicization in the US and the, the all of the people saying we're not going to wear masks, well, they're now dying. Those states that now in the second wave, the highest number of cases, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, I was just looking at this, they are all red states where the governors did not impose a mask rule. So I think we have to be careful about um, that sense of politicization. What's fascinating, of course, is that even that in, in the EU, there's been a certain amount of mask-related politicization, but it's more about lockdown, and you can understand that, but actually very little. If you look at the, um, the responses, if you look at governing authority in the first months of the crisis and actually through to June and even later, you saw a big bump in trust in government, big bump up in trust in government for the national level and also EU level. Um, I think there is upwards of 60 or 70 percent saying the EU needs more competences in the economics and in the health area, which demonstrates that actually the kind of politicization we're talking about is a positive politicization. And just another point on politicization, you know, if I think the Eurozone crisis politicization was completely polarizing and the COVID-19 crisis has been um, bringing people back together. It's much more cooperation than there is contestation. Unfortunately in the US, what we've seen is rising contestation, increasing polarization, as opposed to backing down. I say this, and yet recognizing that um, the new president will be Biden, I hope Trump is listening to this, um, that the president elect is Biden uh, is a good sign. 
that suggests that even the American people are against the kind of polarizing figure that he represents. And that's actually demonstrated by the fact that the Senate may remain Republican because people split their tickets. You know, so that even if I don't understand why they voted Republican, they did, but it's suggesting that the kind of polarizing figure that is Trump is not, uh, is not um, acceptable to the American public, in particular because incumbent presidents are almost never defeated. There are only three in the past century, four in the entire Europe, uh, American history. Okay, and so finally, um, the role of EU as a system and the issues of, of, of sort of the democratic behavior here, this is obviously a reference to the whole rule of law debate. And that, I mean, here again, the EU over the past decade has been uh, pretty much of a disaster in terms of holding countries to account for their illiberal um, drift. And here we're talking Hungary primarily, but also uh, Poland. And actually you can talk about other uh, Central and Eastern European countries as well, highly problematic. Um, the EU as a system has not done its job in terms of throughput legitimacy by not holding these countries to account, not ensuring that they follow the rules. But here, of course, we're back to the problems with the EU, EU's own rules, the difficulties in terms of the unanimity rule, but also the politics involved in the European Parliament. The EPP depended upon Orban's party for its majority, and therefore it was turning a blind eye to the, um, the illiberal drift. There's a big problem for the EU with all of this, but then you know we cite Dan Kellerman who reminds us and others that the US for a long time was a democracy in which it had an authoritarian or even authoritarian or even dictatorial regime in the South for blacks. You know, so you can be a democracy albeit a flawed one, while having non-democratic countries as part of it. Okay, so, um, oh, that's neat. We have three questions. So that, that should make for a, a nice uh, final round. I think we'll probably only have time for this final round. So here we go again. Um, you ready, Vivian? I know we're giving a lot to do here. <laughs> Um, so Mike Gallagher is asking, have the emerging new economy Asia Pacific countries shown a greater willingness to cooperate on COVID than the old economy Eurozone countries, such as with their travel bubbles, et cetera? Can the EU learn from them? Um, Ewan Grant asks, uh, which institutions or organizations within particular member states, EU central bodies or EU funded structures, are showing recognition of your argument. Are there any which are particularly opposed? Um, and he says he's seen the dark side of the, the EC, the European Commission, I guess, firsthand. So are they listening to you? I think seems to be the question. Um, in Jacob Malhoki of the uh, European Institute of LSE doing the political economy of Europe masters. Uh, you've suggested that the ECB needs to become politicized, but this defies the idea of central bank independence. Um, this would avail monetary policy, would expose monetary policy to the risk of politicians aligning with pro-cyclical fiscal policy, which would damage the economy. So do you think uh, oversight of the European Parliament and the Council oversight over the ECB, I think, uh, is what's meant here, would be any help. So I guess do we need to get the uh, more accountable institutions to make the ECB more accountable? Okay, great questions. Um, so again, start from the start from the type um, from the top. Uh, in terms of the pandemic, Asia Pacific cooperation versus the EU, can they learn from them? Um, that's very hard to say. And here you're talking about different cultures, et cetera. Uh, yes, certainly on the tracking and tracing um, and, and all of that, but uh, harder, I think. I think all member states 
at various points recognized how much better Asia uh, and Asia Pacific did in terms of lockdowns and all of that, but also uh, concerns about privacy in particular in Germany, but elsewhere with the various uh, tracking and tracing rules, um, concerns about individual freedom. Can you force people to go to a hospital, et cetera, in some cases. Uh, so um, I don't think we can really compare, but I do think that, uh, that, the, that the Asia Pacific was an example. Uh, you can certainly say that um, the sort of locking the country down and all of that was good, but, um, but we also know that people from China, for example, were able to fly out of the country. They were locked down in the country, but they could fly out. Uh, highly problematic because of course, then the COVID circulates. On um, the second question, which organizations within the EU, EU would recognize my argument? Well, actually, that's a great question because um, in fact, uh, the way this book got started um, is, I mean, I was obviously obsessed with the Eurozone crisis from 2010 on, watching it very clear carefully in terms of all aspects of it um, and developing ways of thinking about legitimacy generally. And I was then invited by the commission, the Directorate General of, of Economics and Finance to, um, uh, to go there on a part-time fellowship and talk to them about legitimacy um, in the 2014-2015 period. So I'd like to hope that they actually listened to me. And I should say that the first, there were three general meetings that they had. And so the first general meeting where all of the fellows, there were 15 fellows, 14 economists and me, political scientists, and um, in my first presentation, I said to them, um, you know, Ali Wren likes to think of you as, sorry, sorry, Paul Krugman likes to think of you as the reign of terror, as an Ali Wren, the commissioner. But I prefer to talk about you as Ayatollahs of austerity. They all died laughing, thinking I was joking. Um, and in fact, when I talked to them after, you know, and I, I basically used the Ayatollahs, I got pushback saying, but wait a minute, Vivian, you know, look at what we've done. Look at what we've said. I said, what do you mean what you've said? Ali Wren says this. They said, no, 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 look, look at the annual growth survey. And that's when I realized that their kind of discourse was in these growth surveys. And by 2014, as I already mentioned, they had massively modified it. And then 2015 on, even more. So it was clear that yes, I think that sort of my discussion and that of others uh, amongst those fellows about legitimacy was a big concern. It was the first time the commission had ever had anyone come talk to them about legitimacy in the context of this. So fast forward to now, I should tell you that I've been giving talks uh, to all of these various institutions. Uh, back in June, I had a talk for the ECB talking about as hero versus ogre. And the only problem there is I couldn't see anyone's face because my internet connection was so bad. Not that it's great here, uh, but it was even worse. So that I saw no one there and they couldn't even see my face. They could just have a disembodied voice. So I don't know what they thought, um, but I did sort of tell them, um, talk to them about this. And more recently, I've actually given a talk for the, for DG, for the Directorate General of Economics and Finance in the commission chaired by Marco Butti, who is now the, sec the right-hand man, head of cabinet to the commissioner, Paolo Gentilone, commissioner of, the econo of economics and finance. So I think that there's been actually lots of uh, welcoming, especially since obviously at the end of my um, by 2015, at the end of my stay at the DG Ekman, I said, you know, I talk, call, called you Ayatollah's of austerity in the past, but now I think of you more as ministers of moderation. Certainly, you know, since. So I guess maybe they like that, but. Um, and I have been asked to give testimony to a committee on the European Parliament. I think it's uh, beginning of December where they're asking questions about the accountability of the European Central Bank. Initially, it was going to be Jean-Claude Trichet and then me talking about the accountability of the European Central Bank. So I was really looking forward to that, but unfortunately they moved me 
to the second panel. So I can't have a face-to-face -face debate with him. Um, but that's to suggest, hopefully, my ideas are circulating about legitimacy because you know what I'd like to just hopefully is also that some of the recommendations. But what I'd like to say is my recommendations are not original. Everyone's been talking. Everyone, meaning scholars, think tanks, policy analysts, etc., have been saying for the past ten years that this has been a disaster. It's simply the you know the EU leaders unwilling to listen. Um, but increasingly, I think the the technical actors have been and been very concerned about legitimacy. So that gets me directly into the ECB question, um, which is I'm actually not asking for it to be politicized in the traditional sense that you're thinking about. Um, I, I recognize that we're not getting rid of central bank independent independence. This was, of course, a it came from a neoliberal idea about what you needed because all politicians are assumed to be rent seekers. So you have to shelter central bank policy from politicians. And that's not entirely wrong. But of course, the way in which they set about creating the rules for the ECB were highly problematic. If you look at the Fed, the Fed has not just stability, meaning inflation in its rules, but, uh, but employment. So it already has a kind of balance uh, that the ECB doesn't have, where it's only about stability, where it's only about the rules. But what you've seen is, and I think this is a good sign, the central bank, the, the, the ECB has been independent, but it's actually been more responsive, politically responsive than, than one would normally expect. So, you know, input legitimate. And it's got a problem because of how independent it is. Most independent central banks are still in the shadow of national politics and recognize the pressures and the needs to respond. But the ECB was created so independent and it is without the shadow of national politics. But what we've seen over time is a clear recognition by the governors of the central bank in particular by the president with Mario Draghi um, and now Christine Lagarde that you need to respond. That this is about political responsiveness but the only way they can respond on the, you know, to the public is by making things work better. And what they've done, therefore, is actually change their rules. Sorry, reinterpret their rules. But they've done it in plain view. And so they've sought to legitimate it through communicating on a regular basis, which is also a way of kind of throughput legitimacy. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, I, I think that I'm not going to be too harsh on the, on, on the European Central Bank. It seems to me that it is sought to be increasingly accountable and it has moved from moved really far from its original positions. It is no longer the ordo liberal invention of people with the image of the German Bundesbank in mind. It has now, as with all, your, all central banks, recognized that they have to play a role in making things work better. That said, its role should be limited to not doing what it did at the height of the crisis, i.e. Jean-Claude Trichet sending letters, actually making policy for the program countries. That is completely illegitimate. So that the ECB actually needs to go back to its role of monetary policy. But in that, it can do a lot by shaping the economy. What bonds, are, what bonds um, is it buying? It doesn't need to buy carbon fuel, you know, carbon producing industries bonds. It could only do climate, you know, it could focus on climate change and greening the economy, for example. I don't think it's ever going to do helicopter money, but okay. Uh, there are other things it can do. But of course, it was waiting for member state leaders to act. And here, that's always the problem, at least now. You know, it seems to me that member state leaders have gotten the point, recognize that the fate of Europe and the EU is, you know, they're all together. And, you know, sort of finally what I realized I never answered the question on Brexit and that's because too complicated. But I would like to say that, you know, just seeing Boris Johnson saying they're gonna focus, uh, that the UK is also gonna focus on greening the economy and getting rid of gas guzzling cars, by 2030 is already a big move. 
um, the state aid rules as well, it seems to me that the kinds of things that the Johnson government is proposing, even as it's saying it's leaving the EU, are very similar to those of the EU. So I don't see the EU as having been authoritarian with the UK. I see the UK as been having un been unwilling to budge uh, with a kind of, to my mind, crazy idea that it can make it, make it alone. And the worry is that making it alone would lead to, you know, more problems for everyone um, in the UK. But, you know, we'll wait and see. I mean, it's fingers crossed on a deal being made. Um, and this is, I think importantly, this is a different EU now with the COVID-19 response. Um, and this is a different UK. So what we can hope for is that even if there is not the kind of deal that I think would be most beneficial to both the U UK and the EU, that that deal would at least ensure that, uh, that the UK, which is a European country, remember, continues to, you know, to move forward in lockstep with the EU, even if not locked in by the EU. What a brilliant note to uh, to end uh, on. I, I, it just occurred to me that you know here we are. Or at least I'm I'm in London, and I guess most of the audience is. Um, you're over in Italy, um, but we've managed to talk for nearly an hour and a half about Europe and barely mentioned Brexit. Uh, so, and that's kind of a blessed relief because, to be honest, I'm sick of hearing about it. Um, not that it's going to go away, because I think one of the and I can't imagine that anything is going to be concluded in any definitive way in a hurry when it comes to Brexit. We're going to be talking about Britain's relationship with the European Union forever. Yeah, forever. Absolutely <laughs> it's, right. It's not going to settle down. And I, I guess one of the interesting things for us is how Brexit voters respond when they hear yet another, another round of negotiations about fishing quotas or customs checks or... or anything to do with the Irish border. <laughs> I think it's going to be a shock to some people. But anyway, thank you so much for that. That's a fantastic talk. It's a tribute to how important and how compelling the book is that we can talk about it in the middle of this COVID crisis, which hadn't happened when you wrote it. And still it's everything that you've got to say is so relevant to the things that we're thinking about and the challenges the EU faces now. So we have, I think, up on the screen, um, the cover of the book. Uh, just a reminder that the book, uh, the title is Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone, is out now, published by Oxford University Press. You can get details about how to get hold of the book uh, on the event listing. Um, I think it's going to be posted in the chat as well, a link to uh, the web page of the book, I was promised. Uh, see if that comes up. Um, but of course, you all know how to Google. And um, I'd encourage you to read the full, the full version. And I hope it's whetted your appetite to do that. So again, many thanks to Vivian uh, for that great talk. Thanks to you all for being here. The attendance at these events is remarkably good considering how, you know, difficult it is to brace yourself for a webinar at the end of the day. Um, and thanks to the team at LSE for organ organizing all of this. Um, good evening to everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for being